Why do you believe Alzheimer's will be considered an antiquated disease in the near future? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. We've all been through scourges. And of course, history has recorded all these scourges. There was a time when people were all concerned about leprosy. There was a time when people were all concerned about tuberculosis. Uh, when I was a little, little boy, uh, my mother uh, would talk about polio. Everybody was concerned because, you know, the guy down the street would wake up one morning and have polio. And so we've gone through these scourges. Of course, HIV was a big one for the 80s and especially in, in the early 90s, just a huge, huge problem. And for each of these, we've ultimately understood them. We've ultimately done something about them. And they have become past scourges. So we have a past scourge of leprosy and a past scourge. Now, HIV still exists, but we're much, much better at, at treating it. Again, thanks in part to all the tremendous healthcare workers. And, and I'll mention you, of course, uh, uh, David Ho, who did such a fantastic job with triple therapy. And so it is now a disease um, that is still a horrible disease, but it's a manageable disease. We're doing better and better with multiple cancers. Uh, and things are con and continuing, of course. Uh, and you know, with the uh, with the immune support, uh, people are doing very, very well. So what I've pointed out is that Alzheimer's will become one of these former scourges. And in fact, we're already on the way. We have people who are now who've improved and who've stayed improved for, as I mentioned, over nine years and counting. And the idea is, if you actually get at what's driving this process, then when you improve these people they don't get this again. You're, you know, now, if they go off, if they actually do the wrong things, yes, they can go back to this. And I think you know, right now we are in a, a global scourge of non-communicable disease, the pandemic notwithstanding, and we may have more pandemics. And of course, well, people are dealing with that. But the big problem at the moment, what is killing most of us is the non-communicable diseases, the cardiovascular disease, the cancer, the neurodegenerative disease, the renal failure, things like that. And I think that this is the century in which these will become past scourges. Please discuss the dual role of amyloid as a toxin and as a protectant. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because it really is one of the cruxes of understanding this illness and what to do about it. And, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. People have said, well, wait a minute, is amyloid good? Is amyloid bad? Well, if you understand that it, it's neither, it's, you know, it's both. So here's the thing. What happened, let's, let's take the analogy of COVID-19. So, uh, you know, a, a little over a year ago, uh, the whole world was attacked by this virus, SARS-CoV-2. We were told to shelter in place. Uh, to distance, uh, to be careful. And so what happened? Businesses were shut down. We went into a recession, things pulled back. So we were protecting ourselves from this insult, the virus, by distancing, by shutting down a lot of what was going on. People stopped going to conferences and things like that. So in, in protecting ourselves, we were shutting down our interactions. And this is very much like what's happened. And there are a lot actually of, of parallels between uh, COVID-19 and Alzheimer's disease. Now in Alzheimer's disease, what happens is you have a molecule called APP amyloid precursor protein, which is actually interestingly a master switch. And so what happens is when your body and your brain senses that things are positive, you have enough trophic support, you have enough nutrition, you have enough hormonal support, you don't have a lot of inflammation, you don't have a lot of infection, things are good. Then just like the president of your country or the head of your company says things are good, we're going to grow, we're going to build. You're able to have that neuroplasticity, you can learn new things, you can make new and store new synapses. Your APP gets cleaved at a single site, which is the alpha site, and you get two resultant peptides, which are SAPP alpha and alpha CTF, C-terminal fragment. These things, well, one's inside the cell, one's outside the cell, things are good. You now grow, you make new neurite, you make new connections and you support that and you make new memories, that's great. And this is what's happening you know, for most of your life. You've got a balance of this with the other side of things, this same APP, when you now have inflammation, reduced hormonal support, reduced nutri nutritional support, on and on, 
The same thing is actually cut at three sites, beta, gamma, and caspase. You now have four fragments, two for outside and two for inside, that are now telling you things are not good. We must go from growth mode to protection mode. It's not trying to kill you, it's protection mode. And one of the four peptides it's made is the amyloid beta peptide. So you can see everyone's been focused on amyloid. It's more than that, it's a bigger picture. But the amyloid as shown by, uh, by Rudy Tanzi and Robert Moyer has an antimicrobial effect. So this is actually a protective uh, mode for your APP cleavage. It is killing, and they've shown it's, it kills some viruses, it kills some bacteria, uh, some uh, fungi. So this is an antimicrobial, this is protective mode. Now the protection, unfortunately, is just like what we saw with COVID-19. The protection it includes downsizing. So the brain is strategizing to say, I must throw myself into protection mode. I will survive by living with fewer synapses. And of course, the problem is, if you don't figure out what's causing this, which doesn't happen when you go to, to, to a center of excellence, they're not looking at what's actually causing this. And so you just keep downsizing, downsizing, downsizing. Pretty soon you can't dress yourself, you can't speak, and you die of Alzheimer's disease. So the whole goal here is to recognize that yes, you are in protection mode. And typically what's been shown is, this is ongoing for about 20 years before a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So when we think of Alzheimer's disease with loss of activities of daily living, you know, that's something that is like saying end stage cancer. We have over a decade to get at this ahead of time when there are minimal symptoms, which is why we encourage people, please, if you don't get on prevention, then at least get in at the earliest possible symptoms. Don't say, well, maybe it's, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe, no, get, let's find out what's going on and you can do something about it. So you're right, amyloid is a downsizer. It is reducing your synaptic number. It's putting a stress on your neural networks, but it's also protecting them. And to some extent, it's, it's saying survival of the fittest. We know we're gonna have to downsize. So what we're gonna do is we're going to put a stress on the system and the ones that are, are going to do poorly are gonna die off. It's a little bit like saying, imagine you say, we've got a hundred people here, we can only feed 80. So we can either give a little bit to each person and watch people die off, or we can put everyone under stress. The 20 are gonna die quickly and everyone else is gonna be fine. And so that's to some extent what's happening with this amyloid. You are downsizing the system in order to survive. So our job, as I said, find out what's downsizing it, address those things, and then support it as you're now able to make new synapses once again. Does water fasting or green juice fasting help with preventing Alzheimer's? Should we do a weekly, monthly, or even yearly fast? It's a great point. So fasting, in, fa in fact, is very helpful. And uh, the approach that we take, which is called uh, KetoFlex 12.3, is a specific uh, nutritional approach as part of it, again, an overall program that is changing your neurochemistry to allow you to keep and make synapses. Um, does include some fasting. but And you have to be careful, as you know, if you are uh, underweight, be careful. You can actually hurt yourself with fasting. But for most of us, um, who are able to fast and, and uh, don't have aren't you know t terribly thin and, and and low low BMIs down you know 18 17 um, then fasting can be helpful of course it does a number of things it improves inflammation it improves blood pressure uh, it em it enhances autophagy all of these things helpful for cognitive decline. And so and it improves ketosis and ketosis is critical because what's happening when you have Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, you have an energetic emergency. You are not supplying the energy to your brain that is required for optimal neuroplasticity. And you can measure that on a PET scan. You look at the PET scan, you see decreased glucose utilization in the temporal and parietal regions of the brain. And you can bridge that gap, as Dr. Stephen Kinane has shown, with increasing ketone level. And so you can do this, you can start out you doing this exogenously because we wanna bridge that gap as soon as possible. But in the long run, it is preferable to do it endogenously. And part of that is fasting. So yes, absolutely fasting can be very helpful.
And how often to do it? We typically have people doing it overnight for 12 to 16 hours, but um, some people like to do it once a week for a whole day or even once a month uh, for a couple of days. And of course there's fasting mimicking diet that uh, Professor Walter Longo uh, has, and there are other ways to do this as well. But yes, uh, the, the phenomenon of fasting and the positive impact it has for cognition, no question.